So hello everyone, I'm uh, Mazuki, I'm with the uh, Lipsitz Laboratory, but doing uh, research in uh, quite a different uh, area from the usual uh, work of Lipsitz. I'm uh, mainly in political science and my uh, research field is internet governance. And uh, maybe some of you were there two, two years ago, I don't know, it was at the beginning of the seminar. I uh, presented uh, um, the different aspects of uh, this work. And today I'm very pleased and very honored to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Nanette Levinson. Uh, she is uh, from the American University in uh, Washington on a short sabbatical of uh, four months, I Approximately. Think, in Paris. We work together. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, she will leave uh, by uh, mid uh, September, uh, mid December. So Nanette works in the. Her main discipline is uh, international uh, relations, and uh, she works at uh, American uh, University currently on internet uh, governance too, and that. Uh, will be the main uh, uh, topic that she will uh, present today. She will present, uh, I think, a synthesis of her work so over uh, many years on the uh, evolution of this uh, whole ecosystem because there are a lot of uh, actors intervening in, the, in this field and uh, uh, a lot of processes that we, we can observe and that would be probably of uh, Maybe not direct interest to your uh, research, but uh, uh, it's also important to know in which landscape uh, and in which uh, ecosystem we are evolving. Uh, so Nanette will uh, present this. I should also mention, because this is a, a trend here, maybe only starting not as developed as in the US, but uh, in France, we start uh, thinking about that and developing some uh, uh, methods and tools. Nanette is, uh, has worked a lot, uh, has been working, I would say, on uh, e-learning and uh, all the methodologies uh, to uh, prepare this um, distance uh, learning. And uh, it's not the, the topic of the seminar, but if you are interested in these methodologies, then Nanette uh, will be uh, more than pleased to, to talk with you. So I will give the floor now to uh, Nanette, and I hope we will have a very interesting discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Miriam. I'm really honored to be here to talk with all of you. And I'm going to give a broad introduction. I have actually, in my entire career in academe, focused on the relationships among technology, society, and especially innovation. And I've had the great joy, as just a few of you in the room may have had, of seeing and being there for the development of the internet over time. And today, I think I'm going to be very interested in sharing with you and in getting your ideas about the role of the technical community and how that actually has changed, if it has changed, and we'll ask that question, since the early days of the founding of the internet. So first, let me provide an overview of my talk today. I'm going to say a few words by way of introduction that really come from my social science background in looking at these issues. And then I'm going to talk about a few frameworks for asking questions about how we decide policy issues related to the internet. And I'm going to actually use the plural. Um, there is no one framework. And you'll see from my comments that it's a very messy governance framework for the internet. And in other work, I have argued that it's actually quite similar in some ways to governance frameworks that are global and that are emerging, dealing with issues such as the environment and health. Uh, and I assume weather, some of you may be focusing on weather technologies. Um, there are a number of technologies that are increasingly global that pose issues 
not just for nation states, but for other entities, including the role of what is called civil society. And I'm going to have more to say about that later on. And then I'm going to talk about some key factors, which I have focused on in my research. And I'm going to mention very briefly uh, the project. There's a very exciting project that Mariam and I are working on together, um, looking at a part of this governance framework where we think there really is a need to learn more. And then I'm going to talk briefly about some international meetings which took place primarily in Paris, uh, but one also, I believe, in Geneva. And I'm going to link that to some very, very recent happenings in the area of internet governance. The last two months, this is incredible. Many of us in this room, or some of us in this room, have been studying and or involved as practitioners related to internet governance for many, many years, since at least 1998 and beyond. But the level of change in the last few months is fascinating, and hopefully we'll have time uh, to talk about that. And I'm going to end my talk with some questions to share with all of you, questions that we will be looking at and that some of you may wish to look at. So by way of introduction, I think you all are familiar with what happens. There are disruptive technologies, such as the internet, um, such as assembly line technology back in 1900, that lead to great uncertainties. And those uncertainties may also be technical, but they interact with social, cultural, and actually even governmental concerns. So as a result of all of these changes, we have seen broad transformations in what I call global governance arenas, not just internet, but as I said, environment, health, even trade. All of these areas, there's great uncertainty. What is the role of governments? Um, a few of us in the room grew up in a time when no one would talk about the technical community or civil society. It was the role of governments to decide and control elements related to telecommunications technology. Today, as we all know, it's quite different. And it's raising many questions, not just about what policy spaces should exist, but actually what's in those policy spaces and who should have the right to decide what goes on in those policy spaces, who can actually participate. Finally, as Maria mentioned in her comments in the introduction, it's really important today that we examine the intersection of technologies and their social context and their governmental context and their power context, all of those interacting. And that's shorthand for an ecosystem approach to global governance. In internet governance today, it sounds singular when we say internet governance, but as I said before, it is a very, very messy space. And there is um, a great deal of contention about which issues should be dealt with in which spaces. Um, and many institutions are involved, technical institutions. Um, how many of you are familiar with what is called the IETF? Almost all of you, no, not all of you, but that is a technical space. It has a wonderful culture um, and it has developed over many years. There's a little bit of controversy now related to that. Um, and I guess I'll just digress very briefly because it's very timely. Um, as all of you have read in the media, and indeed the media is playing a big role today, um, the IETF has expressed great concern recently about um, some of the issues related to the US National Security Agency, the NSA. And indeed, um, one of the concerns there is um, the role of trust. That's a social science, not a technical factor, but the role of trust in the technical community. Um, and the role of governments as they interact with the technical community. I want to say one more thing about government. When we say government, no matter what country we're talking about, or almost all countries, not every country, um, there's not always 
one government point of view. There are agencies within government, as we all know, there are intelligence agencies, as we especially know, in the last few months, or last six months or so. Um, in my government, in the United States government, there are several key agencies that deal with internet governance. Originally, our Department of Defense. Then they say that they hand it off to our Department of Commerce, which handles private sector. Cisco, it handles uh, uh, private sector issues, uh, commercialization issues, because as you know, um, the internet, internet governance issues actually relate to a brand new, or at least brand new since 1998, industry sector. For many of you in the room, you've grown up with the domain name industry. In other words, how many of you have websites? Any of you websites? I have a website. Um, you have to purchase your domain name from a registrar. And there are different registrars. There's a European-wide uh, body that handles registrations. There are a, this is a whole new business. It is a business. Um, all of these individuals are players. And so there's a lot of fragmentation. And oftentimes, people in parts of the internet governance ecosystem do not communicate frequently with other parts of the system. They do their work. Um, and other parts of the system are not necessarily in close dialogue. So um, I argue that we need to look not just at the technical context, but you cannot ever forget the technical context. There's an interrelationship between the technical and the social. And the cultural, I argue, these actually shape the interconnections. And in a few minutes, I'm going to say a few words about culture. But before I say that, I'm going to say also that in this messy space of internet governance with various institutions, in 2006, a new institution was born to deal with, and I'm going to put deal with in, per, in quotation marks, uh, internet governance policy issues. It is a fascinating institution called the Internet Governance Forum. And both Miriam and I have both participated and also studied that forum. That forum is unlike any other actor in this messy space because it cannot take a decision. It was formed as an outcome of the World Summit on the Information Society, a two-year controversial process that gave birth to a working group on internet governance. And as a compromise, that group created and it received its mandate from the United Nations, the Internet Governance Forum, which is now in its about seventh, eighth year, in about its eighth year. Um, and it is, by design, required to be something called multi-stakeholder. This is one of the biggest buzzwords in internet governance. But if I were, for fun, to ask each of you to take out a piece of paper, but many of you are just like me, um, to go to your computer, uh, and we could tweet. Um, and each of us could tweet a definition of what multi-stakeholderism means. And honestly, I think there would be just as many definitions as there would be people in this room. Let me explain. What is multi? Does it mean you have to have um, one civil society person or organization, one technical person or organization, one business person or organization, one government. But which government? Is it EU? Is it regional? Is it ASEAN? Is it nation state government? What about cities? What about global cities? What about, there are many, and civil society. What is civil society? How do we define civil society? There are big debates. This term, if you were to parachute down into my hometown of Washington, D.C., which is a relatively savvy, relatively political, very political, very intense city, uh, just as intense as Paris, I believe, perhaps even more. Um, and you asked someone on the street, are you a member of civil society? They would look at me as if I were from another planet. They would not know necessarily what that term meant. I think people in Europe tend to know the concept more than they do um, in the United States. Um, and we define civil society slightly different. In the United States, we define civil society as at, not at the individual level, 
but as any voluntary organization. And so it can include technical organizations, professional organizations, um, the sport of bowling, a bowling club. There's a famous article uh, that one of my colleagues wrote uh, early, in the earlier days of the internet saying uh, the United States society and civil society was falling apart because of the internet it was called bowling alone. Uh, but many people have found uh, fault with that. But in any event, um, there's no one agreed upon definition of multi in multi-stakeholder. Who gets to be a stakeholder? OK, so you're a member of civil society. You're a member of a technical organization. Well, what makes you a stakeholder? Um, at the Internet Governance Forum, I can attend um, in my role as a professor, but I could attend no matter who I am. I just need to sign up and pay for myself. That's part of the problem with developing countries. I have to get to wherever the Internet Governance Forum is held. But who gets to be a stakeholder? Is there an election? Um, what does civil society mean? There are many meetings, and they're culturally shaped meetings as well. Then we have big issues about transparency and accountability. If I am a member of civil society, and I'm a professor, to whom am I accountable? And that may vary with different cultures and different countries uh, and different professional organizations. Um, what about transparency? Um, can I go to a closed meeting, or should I only participate in open meetings? There are lots of interesting questions about transparency and accountability in our field. What about relations between and among stakeholders? The Internet Governance Forum was founded with the definition of being multi-stakeholder. But there was no rule that said you had to definitely talk to one another. There was an ideal that there would be dialogue among different stakeholders. But what determines those relations? How often do they interact? Do they share ideas? Um, and then we have a major question and a very interesting small debate. And that is, if you or many of you in the room are members of the technical community, are you also members of civil society? Are we all members of civil society? There are some very interesting questions and different viewpoints, respectful different viewpoints. The other point I wanted to make is the evolution. In the very early days of the internet, which actually I do remember, uh, but I was very, very, very young, like some of you in this room, um, the technical community, and, and there are wonderful historical accounts, and I am not a historian of technology, but there are some superb, actually also here in France, this superb historians of technology. But the early technical community dealing with the internet had a much broader vision than the United States Department of Defense did. The United States Department of Defense had this idea in the early days of the internet that it was going to do this for the defense of the country. But those scientists realized there was something else. They started to use it to communicate with one another. And they quietly realized there was much more power in what they were designing, much, much more power. But in those early days, the technical community was the civil society community. Today, we have these wonderful Venn diagrams, these overlapping diagrams. We have many people who believe they belong to actually three or four different stakeholder groups and that they can actually share across stakeholder groups. But again, it's a point of contention. OK, so what are some key factors as we look at internet governance from a social science point of view? There are the structural elements. That means, um, what are the formal structures set up to deal with issues related to policy that go beyond the nation state? And in my work, I've really focused beyond. But also, as I pointed out earlier, even within the nation state, there are messy borders. There are different agencies, and there are power issues among those agencies. Um, I forgot to mention the State Department, the US Department of State uh, diplomacy. It has become increasingly interested in internet governance. And if you look at the Internet Governance Forum today, the United States has representatives there from the Department of Commerce and its National Telecommunications Information Agency, NTIA. 
Department of State. I don't think they send anyone from Department of Defense, I don't think, uh, but it's possible, to the Internet Governance Forum. And those of you from France and from other countries will probably be able to comment um, as well. Interacting with those formal structures, um, and the Internet Governance Forum is just one, but there are so many actors in Internet governance in many different parts, dealing with different parts of the policy issues. But in each area, um, I argue that culture really plays a role. And it's not just national culture, but that can also influence even the words that I'm using. And that's why it's so valuable, I think, to have cross-national research partnerships, because that way we, there's a very good check and balance in making sure that the cultural elements are recognized. But there are also um, professional cultures, engineering cultures, computer science cultures, uh, professorial cultures, private sector cultures. Um, and then within the private sector, there are key issues. Um, there are the um, private sector companies that actually deal directly with internet issues. The Cisco's, the Google's, the Microsoft's, the, um, oh, I want to mention a French, I'm trying to remember your French <laughs> telecom company. Um, <laughs> right, we, Orange, and then there's Telefonica in Europe, which is all over the place, uh, and also in Latin America. Um, all of these have their own, their own particular cultures. And all of this is connecting. And then we have issues that separate the developing world from the developed world. It adds more complexity. And I look at something called absorptive capacity. It's a very simple concept. It just means it's a sponge-like concept. So there are different kinds of absorptive capacity. There's technical absorptive capacity, and that's why the technical community, I believe, is so vital to have always at the table when you're dealing with the policy issues, uh, because you can't make policy decisions without understanding the technical ramifications, the technical infrastructure ramifications. Um, then there's something else that's very vital and that our research has uncovered, and that is, and I mentioned it earlier, the role of trust. Um, and there's some very recent research that says, yes, I trust Marian because I've worked with her and I respect her work tremendously. I've known her for a long time, and I have great trust. That's two kinds of trust there. One is relational trust, but the other that we're seeing more important today is what's called cognition-based trust, which really relates to expertise. So I know, for example, there's a gentleman in the room who has tremendous expertise over the years. Uh, and I would say that he engenders cognition-based trust. Um, and then there's a concept which comes from the knowledge transfer discipline, looking at the diffusion of ideas and innovations. And that's called homophily. And all that means is I trust Maryam because we are similar. And this is trust that comes about not necessarily because of expertise, if I didn't know that Miriam was a wonderful scholar, if I just knew her socially, um, but I know her professionally, um, I would trust her because she is similar to me. She's a scholar, I'm a scholar, she's a woman, I'm a woman. Um, that's what this research says. And finally, there's some very important recent research that focuses a great deal on developing countries, but also there's research in developed countries as well, um, and in the technical field as well. Um, and it is called the role of participation. And clearly, when people are involved and participate in decision making, they are going to adhere to those decisions. And that's also very important for national governments as they get involved um, in these kinds of discussions. What kind of learning takes place when you sit around a table and you have a nation state government, you have a student, you have a technical expert, you have social scientists, you have community advocates, you have non-governmental organization people, and you have the people that uh, Mary M and I are studying, and that is international organizations and intergovernmental organizations, which 
also have a place at the table, a very interesting place at the table, and this is something that we are studying currently. All of these are key factors in understanding the messy internet governance space. And then one of the things that people have said is very positive about the messy internet governance space is network flexibility. Well, that also raises some interesting questions because what is the internet? It's flexible in a sense today. And there are some good debates about whether it should not be flexible. Um, but we need to think about the factor of flexibility. And finally, we have to think about these social factors that I look at in my work as well. Power, good old fashioned power, and uh, also what's called political and social capital, relational capital, as we sit around the table and deal with these very, very complex issues. Just a few last factors. This is one that I focus on a great deal in my own work. And this is a simple notion, a notion of learning, not necessarily individual learning, but organizational and interorganizational learning. Is there, question mark, is there new knowledge gained through multi-stakeholderism? At the Internet Governance Forum, if one does a content analysis of the discussions, the workshops, the main sessions, um, is there new knowledge as an outcome? People have not yet focused. They focused on absence of outcomes. There's a great dialogue about that. Uh, but indeed, there may be some outcomes in terms of new learning through multi-stakeholder exchanges. Um, and then there's even more very recent research, especially from the field of experimental psychology, which talks about priming, priming, that's a word from psychology, priming participants to change their opinions about policy issues. Raising awareness, sometimes even subconsciously. Um, are we seeing, and some authors say yes, and in the environmental area, there's a brand new article that documents a change in beliefs as a result of knowledge transfer in Leach's study of marine aquaculture cross-sector partnerships. So it's an analogy. It's the environmental area. But there's this very interesting exchange of ideas that contributes to learning going on. And then another very recent, actually, uh, um, um, this is a, a basically French study, fascinating study, that looked at, again, the environmental arena, the biodiversity regime. And they found change again. They found learning in a multi-stakeholder kind of situation. And they looked at ad hoc working procedures and repeated interactions among different types of organizations and individuals. And they found that led to deliberative dimensions and change in the environmental governance area. And so we ask, and Miriam and I are actually asking that, is there change in our arena? Question. Well, that's sure. That's Please. So to my understanding, priming is sort of manipulate, deliberate manipulation. Why they're talking about learning, which involves the process of knowledge transfer. OK. Yeah, let me add that um, there are some very recent studies of priming that actually um, um, indicate that it's not necessarily conscious or manipulative, that it can, it can happen um, without that, con it, it can actually be subconscious. For example, if I were to walk out this door and come in and say, um, I'm really honored to be here with a group of brilliant scholars and each of you are doing really exciting things, there's some research that shows that the outcome of that, the priming by my saying that's what you are, the outcome is going to be different than if I walked in this door and said, um, I see some of you here are students, and you may have never heard about internet governance. It's a different kind of, of framing, and it isn't as manipulative, although it could be manipulative. Did, did that answer it for you? Uh, I'm, I'm not just sure about uh Word and knowledge. So learning implies a knowledge transfer. Priming doesn't necessarily imply any knowledge transfer. Right. Priming sets the stage for knowledge transfer. 
It's a foundation if you're going to be doing that. It doesn't always happen. So you have to say, is there, is there some priming that goes on? Um, if you walk into the IGF, there is priming of a sense because everyone knows it's multi-stakeholder and that's viewed as positive at, at that particular organizational setting. There may be, and there are, at least a couple of national governments um, that do not view necessarily multi-stakeholderism as something positive. Or, let me say it another way, um, those governments might say, yes, for certain things over there, you can have multi-stakeholder dialogue, but for us as a national government, in order to protect our people, we need to have the final say, and whatever those people over there say is not going to influence because we have responsibility for making sure that our people either do not have access to certain things on the internet or, or whatever. There aren't a lot of countries like that, but there are a few, and I'm simplifying a bit, but did that? And uh, Marianne, did you want to add, please? Yeah. I yeah. just wanted to add that these institutions, especially the AGF, has, um, have as an objective, or a said objective, to reach consensus. And consensus, not about technical uh, issues only, but also about uh, policy issues and con uh, to reach consensus among uh, a very diverse set of, uh, of factors. So if you want to reach consensus at the end of the day or at the end of 10 years, you have to, um, to build learning but also I think priming is very important in this, uh, in this objective. Thank you, thank you. Very, we could go on and, and uh, discuss, but what I really want to do is to uh, just bring us a little bit up to date. I mentioned the Internet Governance Forum, and one of the fascinating things is uh, from 2006 to 2012, it's still ongoing, but this was my data. If you look at who attended, there is a core list of similar organizations and oftentimes similar people. But it is an expanding list. Clearly, it is expanding. And also, the list changes slightly depending upon where the Internet Governance Forum is located because it moves around the world. Most recently, it was in Bali. Alas, I was not, but Professor Marzuki was. And I don't know, was anyone else in Bali? Uh, OK, at least one of us. That's very important. But in any event, it then draws people from that region. So the year that it's in Bali, you're going to have more people from Asia. Um, when it was in um, Egypt, it was more people from the Sharm el-Sheikh. It was more people from the Middle East. Um, and naturally, that's, that's natural because of the cost of getting to one of these organizational meetings. And also, um, the governments who host the Internet Governance Forum usually perhaps not this year in Bali, but in past years, they have felt it um, a point of pride to make sure there was a good turnout from their region. So they would turn to their sister and brother governments in the region and make sure they sent representatives to the Internet Governance Forum and representatives also from their technical communities. Um, so that there is some difference over the years. and There's definitely an increase in number. You can clearly track the increase in attendance. Um, what we have seen is that the Internet Governance Forum and its processes are then providing a way for repeated interactions. Um, and what's fascinating is that the Internet Governance Forum was born, was created as a part or related to the United Nations. And so it doesn't only just meet once a year. There's a series of processes to set the meeting up. And these are almost always, almost always in Geneva, of course. So you all, if you're interested, have a way easily to get to Geneva. It's hard for those of us in the other parts of the world uh, to get over and participate um, in the preparatory conferences, which are actually very, very important because the individuals who attend tend to interact during the year in preparation for the meeting and also at the meeting. And they develop, of course, relational capital. And this then tends to institutionalize or regularize 
multi-stakeholderism, um, that funny phenomenon that I started out with. So finally, these are my last two slides. In the last year, and I pointed out even in the last six months, we have seen tremendous changes. In December, there was an international telecommunications union sponsored, highly contentious among some countries, including the United States, meeting uh, called the WISIT 12. It, because it was an ITU, an international telecommunications union meeting, um, the ITU does not have a history of formally recognizing civil society actors. Um, it's grappling with this now, it's grappling with it, um, but it hasn't quite gotten there. So the, the prime actors there were nation state delegations, but some nation states insisted on putting members of the technical community and members of civil society or people who were both on their nation state delegation that went to uh, Dubai, I think it was Dubai for WISIT 12. I think it was Dubai. Um, the outcome of that was um, divided. There was not a consensus among all of the governments, um, for many of you who have followed what was happening. And if you looked at the um, outcome documents of the WISIT 12, very, very rarely would you see the word, word civil society or multi-stakeholderism. But just a few months later, um, there was the United Nations sponsored World Summit on the Information Society review of the 10 years since WISIS took place. And there was also the World Telecommunication Policy Forum. I think they were both in Paris. Am I right, my geography? Yes. Yeah. They were both in Paris. Um, and what was fascinating, and UNESCO played a role, at least especially on the WISIS Plus 10 review. It was at UNESCO. Um, one of the fascinating outcomes, if you look at the speeches, the press releases, et cetera, you will see uh, what I call back to multi-stakeholderism from what happened uh, in Dubai. You see great um, adherence, whether people really believed it or not. Nation state leaders, ITU leaders, everyone was talking about it's very important to have multi-stakeholder participation um, in these dialogues. So I want to remind people that as we look at all of this and we look at these changes, um, that we need to remember culture. And different cultures have different characteristics. And there I've listed, I'm not going to bother you with these now, but um, there are major differences among national cultures and occupational cultures, and here are some in this listing. Um, and these really shape the dialogues as well as the outcomes. And I finally want to argue that what we saw, I think, especially at WISIS plus 10, and by the way, you can participate remotely, and you did, I did participate remotely. I could not be in Paris at that time, and the WTF, but especially WISIS plus 10. Um, and also the Internet Governance Forum that I mentioned, I see those as what can be called common knowledge events, where knowledge together is developed. And I argue that there can be changes as a result of that process of common knowledge development. But that leads to my closing question. How? Do specific policy issues rise to the top of the agenda? Is that happening through network connections? Is that happening through power? Is that happening informally, formally? Um, who introduces policy innovations? Is it students? Is it professors? Is it leaders, technical leaders? Um, is it organizations such as the Internet Society? Um, is it a combination? What are the processes from these networks that actually shape what is happening in policy implementation? And here's a question that we know very little about. What is the role of network leadership? I've written elsewhere about the role of a man named Nitin Desai, who was the first head for the first I think six years, first six years of the Internet Governance Forum. Um, he was an incredible leader, at least in my definition of leadership. Um, and he brought about not only a very important dialogue, but he actually helped regularize and institutionalize 
the Internet Governance Forum. But what is the role? And what is the role of technical network leadership? What does leadership mean for the technical community? And finally, I have a diabolical question to ask. Can an event catalyze change? And let me prime, let me prime now by saying, in the last six months or so, uh, the media has covered some very interesting things um, that seem to be catalyzing change in the internet governance arena. We see, and I'm telling you to watch out for this, it's going to be fascinating. I don't mean watch out in a danger way, I mean watch out in paying attention because it may be important. We see a nation state government from the south, a powerful one, Brazil, and we see a fascinating actor in internet governance, an actor that traditionally has been seen as technical and always has des des described its work or has tried very hard over the years, although it realizes it does have some policy implications, to, to describe its work as primarily technical with policy implications. We see the leader of ICANN and the leader of Brazil coming together to convene a meeting this very April, that's going to be quite soon, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to deal with, we're not exactly sure, there was a press release yesterday, so this is happening just as I speak, um, and as I recall, the press release, I think, said, um, well, to deal with, I believe, mechanisms or policies on a global level related to internet governance. So I think we have to think about some of the elements, some of the factors that I identified in my talk and some factors that some of you may be working on, as well as the changes in the technical arena um, in terms of what is going to happen and if there is going to be major change in that messy internet governance arena in the few months ahead and why. So I'm going to stop on that note open up for questions, but mainly I would love to have a dialogue and get everyone's point of view um, around the room in the last few minutes that we have. Thank you very much, Janelle. This was fascinating, and how do you explain what are the, the factors that might uh, uh, maybe change the relations of power and put new actors in, in, uh, in power following uh, some development or certain events that can uh, catalyze change? Uh, I understand that this is quite far from uh, the usual seminar here that you you hear, but uh, if someone uh, thinks about uh, the way IETF has been uh, set up at the beginning and has been working uh, since then, you can also, the multi-stakeholder was not a, a word that was used at, at the time, but we can also think also as, uh, of IETF as a gathering of different stakeholders, but the, 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 the main difference is that it was the technical people inside this, uh, or representing these different stakeholders, including individuals and including uh, academics, talking together and working together. The, the main difference here is that we have a, a more diverse set of people so uh, the process of, of learning from each other is uh, actually, and from maybe reaching consensus as, at some point and on some issue is uh, much, much longer and, and more difficult. But basically, this is a kind of model that uh, we might have inherited from, from uh, IETF and other uh, technical uh, organizations. So, Yes, Annette is looking for a dialogue. Maybe you have a question. Yes, please. I have a basic question for you. You, um, you mentioned several times the term ecosystem, and I think that there's no uh, clear definition of, of uh, ecosystem. So what do you really mean by, by this uh, eco ecosystem? Are these the stakeholders making the, uh, an ecosystem? Or, uh, or that's a wonderful question. Let me repeat the question. The question was, what do you mean by ecosystem? Technically, in the social science field, stemming from really the sciences, the ecosystem refers to 
the organizations that operate in a policy space and their settings, their context, C-O-N-T-E-X-T-S. Um, that's the technical definition of ecosystem, but your, your question is much more nuanced. And I thank you for it, because what you're saying is, are these organizations defining the ecosystem? And I would argue, actually, there's a whole school of thought in my field that says, yes, by the very actions of scientists, technologists, social scientists, academics, uh, citizens coming together, they are actually defining what that ecosystem is. However, there's a debate about who defines the ecosystem. Because in that ecosystem, there are also powerful nation state actors. And there are some nation states in the world who actually um, have a different definition of the ecosystem and of their role in the ecosystem. And that's part of the challenge in internet governance, because there are these different cultures and different views of the roles of government with regard to technology that are clashing. And so um, Professor Marzuki and I are kind of looking at uh, what are the interactions among different types of organizations in that ecosystem, <clears throat> and how are they perhaps shaping how we think about the ecosystem? So I hope I answered that for you, but I also want to say that I like the nuance in your question, because there's no written definition agreed upon anywhere that I can think of that says exactly what the boundaries are. And for different policy issues, there are slightly different definitions of the ecosystem, like intellectual property. If we were talking about intellectual property, we would have slightly different human rights slightly different, and there Professor Marzuki is also um, an expert. So I, I'm wearing my black hat on having a couple of broader questions. Good, good. So uh, in the intergovernmental forums, are there anybody from Bitcoin, anybody from Google? So yes. this kind of process seems to be very long, but the technological changes are very much and then you try to reach consensus, it will take forever. Once you get consensus, what do you do with that? So we are going to influence. They're not going to influence the private sector, they're not going to influence government. So what do you do with that? I, I'm, I said, I'm wearing my black hat. No, but, but it is very, very important because that question is asked by many participants, scholars, governments. So there's a large debate today that says the Internet Governance Forum is great, but there's no, con there's no outcome. And there are a number of organizations that believe today the Internet Governance Forum needs to have an outcome. But you also said something very, very, very important. You talked about the pace of technological change. And in our field, it, in Internet, very, very quick and messy and converging technologies. Um, I can tell you I am not a technical expert, but I could never have predicted. I'm an early adopter, but I could never have predicted even. Um, I, I should also say that I, I was the proud owner in the United States of one of the first portable computers. Uh, there was nothing like an iPad. There was nothing like, uh, no one has an iPad here. Okay, there was nothing like an iPhone or an iPad. Um, I had something called an Osborne, O-S-B-O-R-N-E. He was a brilliant technologist. He designed a portable computer. It was brilliant, but he was not a good business person. So if I had only kept that, it would be worth a fortune today. It would fund, hopefully, scholarships for many of you around the table. But I did not keep it. But, but what the point is is that that technology change is very quick. And as Professor Rossi has just pointed out, um, sitting around the table and discussing and change Political change is usually very, very, very slow. And that is why I said something diabolical in this talk. I said, um, can an event catalyze change? We know that a disruptive technology can catalyze change quickly. But can an event catalyze change? Does anyone know what event I was referring to there, gently, diplomatically? A political event, like what happened in Geneva. You're close. A political event. Everybody's so polite. You know, but especially. Well, go ahead. What made the news? I mean, yeah. Uh, since uh, last June, <laughs> the headline. 
Go ahead. She said football. Yeah. I'm a football fan, but not no. quite. Not quite, but that would be a good, good study. A good study, a good study. <laughs> it was really the, the Snowden. Some better than others. The, the Snowden revelations is what I was really thinking about. Um, those, if you look at the dialogue now, they have truly, they catalyzed uh, uh, the, the leader of Brazil, the president of Brazil. She was furious. And I assure you that the Chancellor of Germany was not very happy uh, when, um, although we might have guessed that if she had a personal cell phone that someone would have been checking it. Um, but something has catalyzed change in the last few months because we've been watching this space for many years. And I don't know, you, you, I would love to hear your comments. You too have been watching it for just a little bit. I, well, I mean, there's always been a tension between the, the standing uh, portfolio that the ITU would like to have and the ISTAR organization, as in the ITF, the ISOC, so forth and so on. The technical. Like, uh, when we talk about reaching consensus on the definition of the ecology, I think, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Because the, um, the IETF people, for example, will always view the ITU people as meaning, well, you can certify copper phone mines or something. Uh, they don't want them at all involved uh, in the internet. So, you know, there's always been this sort of bipolar thing between the, the, the internet people and the uh, ITU going on. I remember the good old days when the ITU would not, I asked them to manage part of the DNS and they said, no, no, we won't. Yeah. We will destroy you and replace you with X500. <laughs> okay, so we, we absolutely won't do it. Yeah. And the thing that's yeah. amusing yeah. is that they, later they're going, well, we should be managing God in because it's, you know, ours. Um, at any rate, um, there's always been that bipolar yeah. thing, and the Snowden thing uh, discredited the U.S. government, or at least gave people a lot of reason to um, lose trust. <laughs> well, you know, all of a sudden, so you know, what's happening, I think, is is that a lot of the traditional internet people are trying to figure out how to have a way ahead without the umbrella of the U.S. government, because, for example, when you talk about governance at ICANN in specifics. There's a lot of governments who say, oh my god, the US, US government, you know, it's in Los Angeles and they could make them delete Syria. Now, right now the ITU is running around saying, ICANN deleted Syria from the domain structure. And in reality, it was that Bashir Assad guy who deleted it because he didn't want his people using the internet. But be that as it may. I think that uh, you know the, the traditional I-Star people are looking at a, a new way forward uh, that doesn't involve the U.S. government. And in the case of ICANN, you know, ICANN is probably going to try and globalize itself. Um, and uh, although I think there's a lot of the governments who'd like to, you know, beat on the U.S., um, but they would like to have somebody in charge of ICANN other than ICANN itself, right? I mean, I think that there's a lot of governments very close to Paris here, say, China. Uh, Paris, maybe in Paris too, maybe France as well. Um, we go, well, it's terrible to have the US government running, you know, supervising ICANN, but it's better than having nobody supervise it. Um, you know, which is, whereas in a lot of the rest of the world, they go, oh, well, the ITU should be supervising it. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of this internet governance stuff that's come by, I see the Snowden thing as being uh, a marketing campaign and really the question is whether or not you have more of the traditional internet model or more of the ITU model. Sorry. But I think power, I think you're on, you're, you're highlighting some very important elements. And I think power is very important, but the question is why now? And it is interesting that it just happens to be the last few months, and this is happening very, very quickly. What about following the money that we are that's another interesting <laughs> argument. That's another interesting argument. And there's a question about the role of the private sector, which I didn't mention. But obviously, there are questions there, too. And the private sector is not one private sector, just like the other. You know, when you say multi-stakeholder, um, the private sector is really complex. There are, yes, those organizations that are very knowledgeable about the internet. But you have clients, your organizations, or private sector organizations dealing with the internet have clients um, that use that organization, but they really are not involved as much in these kinds of discussions. And again, there are questions of trust across the different sectors. 
major question. Yeah, as we have seen Miriam? at Wicked in last December, uh, we have different um, uh, companies' interests or different sector, business sector interests competing. On the one uh, hand, uh, telecom uh, sectors with uh, all the telco companies, uh, and on the other hand, the online services. And these are you at the IGF, uh, following uh, Daniel's question, at the IGF, you find the business sector in general represented by the International Chamber of Commerce, so just one voice. And you have some particular companies, such as Google, and uh, the, the ISPs also are, are there, which are present and really involved in it. Actually, uh, sometimes they sponsor this kind of uh, events at the global <coughs> level or at the regional level because they are also regional IGFs. And they are very much interested in uh, the um, public policy developments uh, which might concern them, especially uh, in their role as intermediary and uh, etc. So they are, they are there and they, they also want to shape and uh, um, not not uh, not the decision because there are no formal outcomes, but the discourse and also the decision that will be made at uh, a national level. Um, I think we have only Just five minutes. minutes. Yeah, please. The scope of the internet is becoming broader and broader, right? And uh, we clearly see the impact that the uh, disruptive impact that uh, we're going to have in health, in the health sector, in the energy yeah. sector, and so yeah. on and so forth. Those sectors are strongly regulated, as we all know. So how do you see the future governance of the internet where it will have to uh, somehow interact with these strongly uh, vertical sectors regulation? It's a, that's a very, very good point, and I am not an expert, but one of the things I am seeing in health is at, it's becoming more horizontal as well as vertical. And that's because health issues viruses, um, other related elements are becoming increasingly global. And so international organizations are becoming increasingly important in this arena. And so I think that there may be actually a, a parallel between the internet sector and some of the more closely regulated sectors. Those more closely regulated sectors are going to become more horizontal. The internet is very horizontal as we know. There are still some entities, some bodies, that want the internet to follow that kind of regulated model. But I don't think it ever will. It will be detrimental for the internet as we, as we know it today. So wouldn't it be a, a, a kind of a, um, sorry, um, you see a word, a negative factor for uh, the innovation we are foreseeing in these sectors? When we talk about e-health, when we talk about e-energy, we are foreseeing plenty of uh, future services, applications based on Internet of Things, comes and so on and so forth, that could uh, never happen because of these issues, right? It's interesting, but I think, I actually think that there may be a movement, and again, I need to turn to, I have colleagues who are wonderful experts on those sectors, but even nanotechnology, I don't know if any of you in the room work on that or if anyone is involved, there's actually now um, an overlap between nanotechnology and internet technologies, as I think many of you know, and they're going to be amazing. There are policy issues that are incredible in the nanotechnology sector they're going to interact with global internet policy issues. And I think we'll be having seminars that are quite different um, in the next 10 years based on what you're identifying. I really think there is going to be more of a trend toward horizontal. And I think we're seeing that even in health and even maybe in the energy sector, I believe. Um, but the next 10 years will, will tell us. There are also cross-cutting issues that touch us on all, all these uh, domain for yeah. Uh, privacy for data yes. protection yes. Uh, in the health sector. Uh, yeah. This is very important. The health privacy. Now the OECD is holding special projects and special discussion and workshops on uh, health, what they call health privacy. 
So uh, it's part of the privacy issue, also intellectual property. And it's very uh, interesting for us as uh, the uh, <coughs> ongoing uh, discussion on the, the transatlantic uh, uh, treaty uh, that some, some call uh, TAFTA. Uh, they, they, they want to have the same kind of campaign against this treaty like they, they had uh, uh, against uh, ACTA. Uh, we can already see that in terms of intellectual property, in terms of uh, data protection policies, uh, it is um, uh, transverse, it, uh, it is cross-cutting to uh, different, uh, this kind of uh, different uh, domains. So what is your point of view? What you said, uh, we are not experts on this domain, but I would like to know what is your point of view. What should change in regulation, in governance, in such a way that innovation in those sectors will be facilitated? That's actually something we are thinking about, but one of the things that I think we can no longer do is go back to the future. In other words, I think that nation states are not going to go away. There are some scholars who have argued, you know, nation states are going to, they're not going to go away. But at the same time, they are going to increasingly have to deal with global issues. And you mentioned health, energy, the air we breathe, um, the technologies we use, they are increasingly global. The content, uh, yes, we're going to have internet, we have internationalized domain names today, they're just taking off. We have local content, that's not going to go away. There's probably more internationalized domain names than there are active domain names. So they are, ah. they say they're just coming into play. Okay, okay, but when did the, it's the last couple of years, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so it's, it's relatively recent. There's your timing, the technology timing, and we've got to keep up with our studies to, to sort of match, match, that, match that issue. Um, and I, I want to close with just a comment building on what Dario said, and I want to share something. Um, I was interviewing a Federal Communications Commission in the United States. That's the regulatory body uh, that deals with communications in the United States, policymakers. And he was very honest. He said to me, we are far behind. He was talking about broadband, and he said, our policies are so far behind, we cannot keep up with the technological changes. And interestingly, if you look at where the United States is in broadband, it's not at the top of the list. And the policies have not kept up. So I think as, as technologists, we also have to think about um, the timing um, factor and the impact and interaction of technologies with policy making and then to build on the comment of your colleague next to you, Professor Rossi, um, the, the comment about the interplay between vertical and horizontal regulation. I think that's something we're going to increasingly be seeing in the next, not just 10 years, in the next five years, clearly, and clearly across sectors, not just in the internet governance sector. So I'll end with that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sanet. It was a very good conclusion. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Nanette for her presentation, and uh, thank you for your Thank you for the questions. Great questions, Thank you.